Welcome, greetings everyone who is joining us here live and in person. Those of us who are gathered virtually, welcome. Those of us who will see this later, welcome to you as well. I am Dr. Jared Ball. Uh, among other things, I'm a professor in the AAAD African American African Diaspora Studies program. I've been here at Morgan since 2006. I'm very happy to be a participant uh, in, involved in this particular convocation. And I want to thank uh, the Convocation Committee, Dr. Johnson and the rest of the committee, uh, the uh, tech crew and everybody making this event possible. Uh, and again, all of you for joining us. So what we're going to do this morning is play a video, pre-recorded video presentation from me uh, about a variety of things related to Dr. King and Malcolm X, uh, making a particular argument in sum about the uh, media portrayal of Malcolm and Martin versus the politics that these men worked with and attempted to represent and be exemplars of. Uh, and then after the video, it's a little over 30 minutes, I'm happy to engage in any conversation, dialogue, uh, respond to any questions, critiques, criticisms, conundrums, catechisms, cacophony, calumny, et cetera. So with that said, uh, let's go ahead and get started. Again, it's an honor, of course, to be uh, uh, hosting this, and it's always an honor to be able to talk as much as possible about the greats of Malcolm X and Dr. King uh, and those with whom they worked, and more importantly, even the ideas that they worked with. So, Mr. Moore, if you're ready, let's go ahead and check it out. In other words, is a discussion of Dr. King and Malcolm X in 2022 still that relevant? So my initial response, and this was even before this latest piece drop, was, um, uh, of course, I'm biased, but of course I said, well, absolutely, it's still relevant given all of, if for no other reason, all of the attention paid and encouraged and the rebranding involved uh, uh, by the powers that be that we from time to time be reminded of our great leaders. Of course, be reminded in a way that those in power would prefer we be reminded. But that is so I said, you know, we've had, uh, you know, all these Netflix documentaries about Malcolm X. We had the, F the, the, the Hulu series about Dr. King and the FBI come out. We've had, uh, you know, movies, whether it's Selma or, or you, you know, um, uh, the, 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 what was the one, One Night in Miami, you know, you know, all of these pop cultural references and we as educators needing, of course, to make more meaning of it than they do for our students, if for no other reason, then of course it's still relevant. Of course, I think they're still relevant beyond all of that because, and this is ultimately always my point, the ideas that they worked with, that is Malcolm and Dr. King, uh, even more importantly than them as individuals, even more importantly than even the the specifics of the civil or human rights struggle or the black liberation struggle here. These ideas of anti-imperialism, anti-capitalism, socialism, pan-Africanism, nationalism, uh, uh, revolutionary you know, nationalism, uh, um, uh, guerrilla warfare, uh, you name it, whatever they were all working with, of course, these ideas are still relevant, um, uh, in particular because the conditions that brought and make those ideas relevant are still uh, at play and in, in most cases worse now. So, uh, of course, they're still relevant. So when thinking about Dr. King and Malcolm X, they do provide, in many ways, perfect exemplars. They are perfect exemplars of uh, various efforts to apply, to interpret, involve, and engage various radical ideas, make them relevant for their time, uh, and to, to impact their communities and movements in ways that continue to need to be rebranded, restructured, with energies redirected in other ways. So each of them, that is Malcolm and Martin, were seen as threats by the state, by conservative racists, by the black bourgeoisie, and white liberals alike. Particularly by the end of both of their lives, both of them were equally, in many ways, seen as threats by that compendium of uh, 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 
segments of the society. So for my old presentation, I just always like to remind of, of, of at least these couple of points that that uh, the counterintelligence program or COINTELPRO mounted by the FBI to disrupt, mis misdirect, discredit, and otherwise neutralize the civil rights, Black liberation, Puerto Rican independence, Native American anti-war socialists, and new left movements in the 1960s and 70s, uh, and one of the most notorious U.S. government's domestic anti-radical programs ever developed, engaged in what was called black propaganda or the distribution of fabricated articles, leaflets, et cetera, that misrepresented the politics and objectives of an organization or leader in order to discredit the group or individual and to pit uh, organizations against each other. The goal of the COINTELPRO specifically targeting black people was to prevent the rise of a black messiah who could unify and electrify the militant black nationalist movement. Malcolm X might have been such a messiah. He is the martyr of the movement today. Martin Luther King, Stokely Carmichael, and Elijah Muhammad all aspire to this position. King could be a very real contender for this position should he abandon his supposed obedience to white liberal doctrine of nonviolence and embrace black nationalism. But three years before that, he had already been targeted as described here by William Sullivan, the head of uh, FBI's COINTELPRO operations for Hoover. Um, King had already been targeted uh, uh, with a plan that aimed at neutralizing Dr. King as an effective Negro leader. In light of King's powerful demagogic speech, that is the March on Washington, we must mark him now if we have not done so before as the most dangerous Negro of the future of this, in this nation from the standpoint of communism, the Negro and national security. Their media representation reflects how they were and are still being used to redirect righteous anger and radicalism into safe and convenient tributaries often managed in corporate and nonprofit liberal structures. It is also interesting to note that both in terms of Morgan State University, it is it, we it is good to be reminded of the fact that both Malcolm and Martin uh, uh, visited Morgan State University, Dr. King, June 2nd, 1958. Uh, and Malcolm himself had been there uh, during the August Meyer debate. Chapter of Omega Sci-Fi, March 28, 1962. Mal the minister was invited to the university by the chapter to debate former Morgan professor, Dr. August Meyer. Malcolm X argued the case for black nationalism while Meyer uh, defended integration. And as I said, both Dr. King and Malcolm X were targets by the press in their lifetimes. Both were assassinated under unclear circumstances. Both have been misrepresented posthumously to have their radicalism downplayed. And as I was saying earlier, both are still relevant because the conditions against which both men were fighting and struggling and organizing are worse now, or at best are not changing at rates commensurate with the need for that change or for with even the energies and the ideas and the arguments of those men and movements in particular. Um, and then of course we still have political prisoners. So that is to 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 me, and I and I think not enough of us, but to to many others, uh, proof positive that the the change in society that we we would want has not occurred. Uh, otherwise, Assata would have been welcomed home with a parade and a national, you know, you know, week long celebration uh, with the 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 redistribution and the changes of power that she was fighting for having taken place. We would have seen Matulu out. We would see Sundiata out. We would see Leonard Peltier out, uh, Mumia freed. I mean, all of these things would have long, Veronza Bowers, all of these things would have long occurred uh, or be occurring. So th they are proof positive that that uh, their, their continued existence as political prisoners is proof positive that the change we're looking for has not occurred. So a little bit about the 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 similarities in that media treatment, and this is just again from uh, presentations I've I've uh, been working with for for several years. Just again, in 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 summary, the the sources of the mainstream media and political hostility directed at Malcolm and Martin in their lifetime, and I would argue in, in perpetuity uh, in media depictions, is that each. Uh, Malcolm, each of them expressed deep commitments to Black unity and to extending that unity to global and anti-colonial imperial struggles. Both Malcolm and Martin expressed fealty to anti-capitalist ideas, uh, or, uh, or said differently, they expressed affinity for socialism, even communism, certainly uh, radical pan-Africanism, uh, and world majority unity. Each expressed strong and particular criticism of the black bourgeoisie and white liberals. 
Each expressed zero confidence in legislation and conventional methods of protest politics. And each expressed support for direct action campaigns. That is, of course, most often forgotten and ignored when it comes to Dr. King. As Joshua Grimm has covered in his work on the subject, uh, the New York Times as an exemplar, we could we would say in today's world, you know, something like Twitter or or you know even TikTok, uh, constructed oppositional identities of the two black leaders in their lifetime. Malcolm X was framed as the doppelganger to King. They were portrayed as opposite men with opposite goals. That's at least initially. As Kimberly Powell and Sonia Edmundson have said in their work on the subject, the media created an image of Malcolm X as a violent, power-hungry extremist who was primarily interested in harming the white population in the United States. Contrasting Malcolm X with Martin Luther King Jr. in the media fostered this negative image. The, the two men were described as opposite ends of a spectrum. King is advocating nonviolence. X is advocating violence. King as a black minister. X as an ex-convict. King as a civil rights leader. X as a racial fanatic. Again, with Powell and Amundsen speaking specifically of Malcolm X's treatment in all of this, Black Muslims and thus Malcolm X were characterized as extremists within the media. And actually, I should correct myself because this is still part of the same hustle. Because yes, this is focused on Malcolm X, but I think it is important to be reminded that what is being done here is not just, again, as, as, as media studies has argued for a long time, we don't judge each other by who we are as much as we judge by who we are not. So in projecting Malcolm in this way, they are tacitly or implicitly saying, we, as in the rest of society, black or white, should reject all of these uh, versions or approaches to whatever our interests or particular religions or, or uh, politics are. So anyway, as Powell and Emmonson say, Black Muslims and thus Malcolm X were characterized as extremists within media, within the media. The media created this, Im the, this image with the terms used to describe Malcolm X and Black Muslims, anti-Christian, anti-white, alienation, agitators, Black supremacy, bitter, confrontation, cult, enemy, extremist, exploit, hate, militant, separation, sect, threat, and trouble. These terms appeared frequently and with high intensity, shaping a negative image of Malcolm X in the media. Just wanted to pull up just a little bit, as I said, of what was some foreshadowing earlier. Um, in terms of the Netflix piece, now I know this most recent thing was on, on, on Disney and uh, ABC. Uh, although there's, there's, overlap there as well um 2.2 billion 24 one uh, let's see netflix 12 income and revenue or 2 billion 24 billion revenue da, 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 da. the top three individual shareholders leslie kilgore david hyman greg peters i'm less interested in that at the moment uh it's the institutional ones um the institutional investors hold the majority of Netflix shares at about 83% of the total shares. So the top three individual folks are, are, you know, relatively irrelevant when it comes to where the majority of the shares are held. Um, and this is where you start to see some of those familiar names. Uh, Capital Research Global Investors, of course, you get the Vanguard Group and BlackRock. And that's, those are the sort of two that, that, come up everywhere, Google, Alphabet, Amazon, Netflix, Hulu. Um, so not much other than that, just to say that, the, that these folks see these, these shows and these series and these networks as products, as part of, of what will bring revenue to their shareholders. So again, it's not a one-to-one. -one. It's not necessarily the the you know the, the smoking gun evidence, but it's just something I like to be reminded of and to remind others of that these media, even the ones we like, are themselves really small, tiny products meant of of international conglomerates, of hedge funds, private equity groups that are only wanting a return and wanting to project an ideological sort of safety net for themselves into the world. So it, it, it isn't, I think, something to be taken lightly, uh, um, even if we're not, you know, looking for this, this, you know, 
again, supposed smoking. So, so that was just one. And then for Disney, um, so you see here right at the top, Vanguard, and then number three is BlackRock. And they're actually on here twice, three times. Actually, I'm not sure how that works. Uh, but these are the notable holders of Disney stock. So, so I did want to remind that not only are these Disney and Netflix products, but that Disney and Netflix are themselves products uh, of smaller entities. And that, of course, ABC, the channel on which this aired, is a subsidiary of Disney and has long, long been the mouse. First, it's important to understand who we're actually up against here. When we're talking about Marvel, what we're really talking about is Disney. And Disney doesn't do cycles of beginnings and endings the same way everyone else does. It's actually ingrained in the company's origins. Back before Disney started making movies, if a film failed at the box office, that was usually the last you heard of it. Television was only just coming into being, reruns weren't even a word yet, and the idea of re-releasing anything but a successful movie would have been a pretty big novelty. It's actually estimated that more than 50 percent of movies made before 1950 are literally gone forever because unless they were a big hit nobody bothered to save a physical copy of it 50 percent think about how much lost media that is but disney originated in the world of animation a world that is all about saving and reutilizing assets before computers animators would have to draw each cell by hand so to make life easier the animators would just draw different characters over the same cells classic example of this sleeping beauty's final dance is copied identically for beauty and the beast's iconic Iconic ballroom waltz. Stuff like this makes it immediately apparent why it would never make sense to throw this away. Everything has value. Did you know that Fantasia, Alice in Wonderland, Pinocchio, Peter Pan, even Bambi were all either box office disappointments or just outright money losing films when they first came out? In fact, things got so rough for Disney that the shareholders basically forced Walt to just do Snow White again in the form of Cinderella so he could have an actual hit. So then why are all these considered to be among the most recognized and creatively accomplished Disney films of all time? PR. Where the bigger film studios of the golden age of cinema mostly disdained television as the lesser medium that would cheapen the art form. Sound familiar much? Uncle Walt got himself a TV show to promote all the stuff that his studio was doing, while also rehabilitating the reputations of the Disney movies that didn't initially get the best reception in theaters. Perhaps an outstanding example of this occurs in the opening scenes of our cartoon feature, Bambi. As a result, a generation of baby boomers remember them as foundational Disney classics because shrewdly, Disney regularly replayed the most memorable parts of those films on his show, eventually priming them for a more successful theatrical re-release and permanent life as physical attractions at Disney parks. For an excellent example of this, just check out Sorcerer's Apprentice Mickey with that red robe and his wizard's hat. Probably the second most famous Mickey look ever, and it's from Fantasia, one of the least successful big Disney movies of all time. Now that is taking a lemon and turning it into lemonade. Now, with that context, ask yourself this. Why was such a huge chunk of Avengers Endgame dedicated to revisiting events from For the Dark World of all movies? The most panned MCU production up to that point. Well, maybe, in true Walt form, Endgame was making that movie cool to revisit because, well, it might not be good, but let me tell ya, it pays off 13 movies down the line as part of this epic conclusion. And you see, that's Disney's other little secret to success here. Well, everyone thinks that they're in the movie business, they're really not. Or at least that's just a small portion of what they care about. They're actually in the IP business, owning cultural touchstones and then making money from all the clothes, toys, costumes, food tie-ins, and rides that stem off of it. Honestly, we could probably dedicate a whole video just to the idea that Disney, much like McDonald's, is a company just as much about theme parks and real estate as they are about movies and TV shows. So, so for, for our purposes or, 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 or my own, at least is, is the cell regeneration that is being described there. That is the reuse of previous animated cells for the ease of reproduction and mass dissemination. I'm thinking of ideologically. So when they talk about so if you think of it from from an IP perspective, so to speak, and dominant media in the society, Malcolm X initially was a failed product. He didn't hit properly in the box office of societal ideological production. Once assassinated physically, he can be 
those pre-existing cells of or those pre-existing produced images and sounds and even written words of Malcolm can be repackaged, represented, recharacterized and contextualized and turned into a hit for Disney specifically, but society writ large. So again, ideologically speaking, Malcolm in his original form was a failure. His 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 affinity for nationalism, black liberation, anti-capitalism, anti-imperialism, guerrilla warfare, armed self-defense, that ideologically is unacceptable. It's a failure from the perspective of mainstream corporations or society itself ideologically. It's a failure. But to Disney's point, that failure need not be discarded forever. That failure, we just need the intellectual property, especially once physically removed from the earth. Malcolm becomes more valuable, just like artists. And Disney can bring him back. The ideological apparatus can bring him back, re-situate him, and make not only financial gain, but ideological gain. Particularly in a moment, as I continue to argue we're in, where every issue can be raised to a level of national, public, popular, distorted, liberalized, narrowed conversation. It is, of, it is of great value in a moment like this to be able to dig back into those Disney archives and bring out some old IP. Again, Malcolm is not here anymore. And apparently those who would accurately reflect or represent his work and ideas aren't involved in any of this, can't be involved in any of this. So even in going back to 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 uh admittedly um some of my own particular work on this issue uh but uh, but others who have looked critically at the role of intellectual property this is the point that intellectual property has always been about the management of ideas who owns and therefore can control the dissemination and of course the benefit financially from uh, of from or of th that dissemination of those ideas while others have focused on it traditionally economically, I'm more interested in uh, even economically what this means, but ideologically, politically, what does it mean? That That is, it's it's about the control and ownership of ideas and who can disseminate what ideas. And, and then to the point of Huey Newton uh, uh, and power being the ability to define phenomena and have it act in a desired manner. And then even to the point made in that little clip to Disney's strategy, even when you take the, the the previously failed IP and repackage it and redistribute it, again, yes, you you there is financial gain there, but the 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 importance is it's reinscribed in the generations of the youth. So then a generation of youth have grown up thinking like my generation that Bambi was this, that, and the other. It was a failed IP. Today's youth, particularly black youth and anti-colonial youth and those in political struggle youth are encouraged at least to pick up a Malcolm, if at all, under this false and misunderstood rebranding of the original or at least in terms of the impact. So Bambi did not have that original impact that that character would later have. The IP was picked up, repackaged, rebranded, and then imposed on another generation in a different way, using a different medium of communication, the television versus the film. And that new generation grew up, like mine, thinking of Bambi in a different way. You couldn't, my generation would have never thought Bambi was some formally discarded failed product. 
today's generation would never think of or is not meant to think of Malcolm or King or others in their original form or in the in the form that brought their original impact on this society because that original impact ideologically from the perspective of those in power was a failure. This new version, absent socialism, pan-Africanism, black nationalism, guerrilla warfare, redistribution, anti-imperialism, da, 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 direct action. This version is now a hit. And we could talk about them all day. We could talk about how their brothers killed them. We can talk about how the FBI was around, but, but you know, it was the Muslims. We could talk about how, you know, everybody was surveilling King, but he was cheating on Coretta. You know, we could talk about, I mean, we could do all of that. We can do all of that because this is, this is the reapportioned or the repackaged acceptable IP. And as one contemporary example of how all of this works, we have Baba Zach Kondo, one of the leading researchers into the history and assassination of Malcolm X, speaking with us last year about his regrets having been included in one of the more recent Netflix series on the assassination of Malcolm X, or ostensibly on the assassination of Malcolm X. Yeah, first off, the Nets the Netflix piece, if if I could, I would airbrush every scene that I was in it. Mm -hmm. I regret it was a mistake on my part. You know, I've been in a lot of, uh, you know, documentaries, Malcolm, the Black Panthers, different things like that. This is the only documentary that I've ever been in that I realized it was a mistake, but I didn't know it was a mistake in part because I didn't do my homework. The first mistake that I made, and normally I would do this, and I can't figure out why I didn't do it this time, is I would figure I would find out who the producer was. I didn't. Uh, I knew that the people who were doing the filming and stuff, I talked to them, and I knew some of their other work, some of which I didn't, you know, really appreciate. But I didn't find out. I didn't find out until they had filmed me at the end of the last filming is when I realized that Skip Gates was the producer. And we've had this conversation, Jared. If I would have known that Skip Gates yeah. was behind yeah. that film, when they first contacted me, I would have said, hell no. to the no. But I didn't know that. And so I, I, have, to, I have to live with that. Hmm. Okay. Um, you know, because I don't I don't trust, you know, I don't trust Gates. I don't, you know, I don't, you know, I, I've seen his documentaries. I I don't respect him, you know, as an African scholar, because I don't think he considers himself an African scholar. I think he considers himself a scholar who happens to be black. So I don't have no time for Skip Gates, but if I would have known, knowing his commercialization history and mm -hmm. other things, no discussion was needed. I would have called it a day, but I didn't know that. I also had no idea what angle they were coming from. You know, because mm -hmm. all I did, you know, and they interviewed me twice. I, I went up to Brooklyn one time and they interviewed me like most of the day. And then they came to my college and they interviewed me all day. They came at around 7, 7.15. I had a class at eight o'clock. They came into the classroom. And they basically stayed with me until 7.30 that night. And I spent the bulk of that time talking about the FBI and the NYPD and their role in Malcolm's assassination. And when they interviewed me in Brooklyn, I spent the bulk of the time talking about the nation, the FBI, and the NYPD. So I'm thinking, you know, that, you know, I'm giving them some good stuff. And then when I see the film, I'm there all day yeah. at my college. And when I see the film, they had 10 seconds. They showed a scene where we were sitting down at my desk. Muhammad was sitting next to me. I guess he was asked, he asked the question, something like that. And then that was pretty much it. But that wasn't the worst part, you know. I can deal with that. The worst part about that film is that 
And it's real clear, you know, now what Gates and whoever funded it, what they were really all about. It was about basically showing the nation of Islam's role in Malcolm's assassination. It was about simplifying Malcolm's assassination as complex as it was. They wanted to simplify it to make the point that maybe possibly behind the scenes, the FBI might have, you know, did a little bit here and there, but they had nothing to do with the, with the actual assassination, same thing the NYPD. Um, that was the political angle of that film. And see, my thing is this, and, you know, and, you know, I, I don't need to say this to y'all, but the nation deserves to be, you know, pulled out there. No mm -hmm. problem with that. That's what I do in my book. Mm -hmm. But how the hell can you put all this emphasis on the nation, but you ignore all of the disruptive tactics that the FBI and the NYPD were doing? And I, and, and, and I well documented it. And this was also real interesting. And I didn't realize until at the end what that was about. When I was talking about the FBI, and I would talk and talk and talk, and I would, you know, sometimes pull out my book and give them a citation and all that type of stuff. Their thing to me was, but do you have the actual, a copy of the actual document? Huh? I wrote the damn book 26 years ago in my office right now. Do I have a copy of the damn documents? No, I don't have a copy of the documents. But that is what they needed in, you know, from what I can gather now, that's what they needed in order to put it in the, you know, in order to, I guess, validate my statements about the FBI. Even if I'm reading directly from a document, they didn't want to hear it for legal reasons and all that type of stuff. But here's the thing. When it came to talking about the nation and all of the different, you know, all the garbage that the nation was doing, you didn't need no extra documents. They weren't asking for no damn FBI files and all that when it came to the nation. Whatever you got to say, we want to hear it for the nation. But if you're going to talk about the FBI, we need, for liability and legal reasons, we need to see some type of credible sources type of stuff. And it has to be the actual sources. No, that was a sure, you know, that really was a charade. Yeah. Um, and like I said, if I could take it back, I would take it back. My understanding is they're doing a second one and they need not knock on my door. Not to mention the fact that there was nothing, and I, I want to make this point real clear because the more you know, like, I've only been able to see this film one time. I mean, excuse me, one and a half times. I started seeing okay, I saw it the first time, and I was, you know, and the second time, you know, I couldn't see it. You know, I was watching it with my wife, and we were watching for a little bit, and then I realized I started falling asleep, and then I realized it wasn't that I was tired, is that I did not want to waste no more time with this bullshit. Yeah. But 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 here's the thing, there was nothing in that documentary that represented new information that had not already substantively been covered in my book. Nothing, nothing of substance. And nothing. the same can be said about Manning's book. Yeah, because exactly. Manning yeah. Is so, and, yeah. and presented as his own idea of the theory of what happened, the actual players and so forth around Malcolm's assassination. And if I, uh, you know, I don't remember the quip exactly, but basically he said something to affect that all those books in the 80s didn't amount to much. On right? page 490, <laughs> he says something to the effect that everything written in the 90s is irrelevant, yeah. which would include Baba Zat, sales. I mean, how, I mean, yeah. right. But are you, something, are you hearing something interesting? I talked to Marable maybe, maybe about a year or so uh, before his book came out and he transitioned. And we were talking on the phone. And what Marable says to me is he says that, you know, how much he appreciated my book. And he said that my book was the gold standard. So then I was real curious when his book came out to look to see what he said about my book or about me. And I think I'm a, I think I'm a reference. I think I'm a reference somewhere in there. I'm like, a, I'm an end note. I'm a footnote or something like that. 
But it's like, that's not what this guy, this guy's telling me, you know, you know, your, your analysis and your ability to penetrate issues mm -hmm. and people, you know, he's giving me all this stuff. And then, like I said, there was like one, I saw, I saw one reference and that was it. You know, I, I, I don't know, you know, <laughs> I mean, I didn't know Marable that well, but you know, I, I was kind of scratching my head a little bit on that one. To whatever extent we're able to continue to do this. Uh, I think we do need to continue to remind people that um, as symbols, never mind the importance to their individual lives, and I don't mean to diminish that, but it, 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 as symbols, uh, Dr. King and Malcolm X are, are remain uh, essential, beyond relevant. Uh, not only should they to us who want revolution, who want real change, who want a new and improved world, uh, but to those who don't, and this is why we continue to get the, the, the media products that we do. And I, again, think that that includes um, uh, the, some of the work we've discussed here. Like this, the Netflix documentary, Who Killed Malcolm X? Uh, or this one, even the recently released Judas and the Black Messiah, about which I think we've raised some serious questions and commentary or, or around here. Uh, and even this one related to Dr. King that we've also talked about here, Dr. King and the FBI uh, and others in the pop cultural and documentary space. I mean, these these uh, to those in power, these men remain important as symbols uh, because of what they represented as threats to the state, conservative racists, the black bourgeoisie and white liberals alike. Their media representation does continue to reflect how they were and are still being used to direct righteous anger and radicalism into safe and convenient tributaries, often managed by corporate and nonprofit liberal structures. that the press in their life targeted and intentionally used Malcolm and King as symbols against one another personally, but also the movements and politics they represented. And posthumously, each of them post-assassination, that is, have continued to suffer these assaults that come packaged as honors, commemorations, symbolic virtue signaling, uh, but, but are really gross distortions of who these men were and what they represent and continue uh, uh, to mean to many people who do want revolutionary change in this world. Um, and ultimately, uh, as Daruba bin Wahad has said about Malcolm, when we're always asked what would the world be like were they were men like that or, or were those two men in particular still alive they would be political prisoners so uh we should be reminded by the continued existence of political prisoners that the movements the politics the ideas that king and malcolm actually worked with uh, uh are still relevant and the movements in the world that they were trying to achieve has not come close to coming into being in terms of the context. Um, so if any of it seemed disjointed, I do apologize. and I'm happy to discuss any of that with, with you all uh, now. But essentially what I was just trying to show is that, that there is a politics to media and those who produce media have long understood that media are, are part of an assortment of weaponry meant to organize the public opinion of those under the purview of that media. So what, I'm trying, what I was just trying to quickly show is that a lot of the pop cultural references we continue to get of these two men and the movements that they worked with and that they came out of are meant really to impact you, most of the people here and who will end up watching this later on. It's meant to convince you all that the men that existed in their lifetimes either weren't who they were, the ideas that they worked with are not relevant, and that the movements that they represent are of some, some sort of past moment 
uh, and represent something that has already been successfully traversed. So if you look at the material conditions, particularly of black people in the United States today, all of the dominant major indicators of assessing a group's material condition are worse today than under the times when Malcolm and Martin were alive. The material inequality in, in the country and around the world is worse. There's more surveillance, more hostility, more militarism, more police violence, uh, more poverty. All of these issues have increased, and yet these men and their ideas are consistently attacked in terms of how they're presented back to people in uh, uh, today's world, particularly to, to youth. So again, uh, the ideas that they work with, the radicalism of Dr. King is not reflected in his monument in DC, is not reflected in most of the so-called tributes to him. And then Malcolm X similarly has had his radicalism and uh, uh, analysis diminished so that it would not have the impact on you that it was having on youth in his time. So let me stop there and invite any comments or questions uh, and, and maybe you know, I can make a little of this more clear or we can engage as uh, those two men would have uh, encouraged anyway. So anyway, thank you all very much. And uh, if you all have any comments, questions, queries, conundrums, catechisms, I see somebody's hand is up back there. Thank you very much, Dr. Johnson. <clears throat> thank you. Hi, my Hello. name is Taryn Graham. Uh, I'm a political science major, and I was wondering, um, a big point that you were mentioning was about how Malcolm X and MLK were both anti-capitalist, and I feel like that part of their ideology is always left out, and I really want to know why, because today I see, like, when anti-capitalism or communism is brought up, like, it's a skewed version or a different type of image of what it actually is and what they actually wanted. Well, I mean, I think you, you answered, I mean, in many ways you answered it. The, 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 those who are in now in control, and that was sort of the point I was trying to get at with intellectual property and the, the reference to Disney. Intellectual property is the legal mechanism that allows those in power to control all the ideas and the images and the art and to determine what becomes popular and what disappears from hip hop to radical consciousness. Uh, these are capitalist organizations run by capitalists who understand, as even Karl Marx in his own critique said, it's not just a matter of capitalists owning the means of production in a material sense, they have to own the means of mental production as well. So for those of us who study media or communication studies, uh, honestly, we know that that field emerged specifically uh, as an extension of an imperial capitalist need to manage and measure, measure and manage and shape public opinion because that is the primary mechanism of dominance. Violence comes in at the moment of weakness. Initially, if you can, again, like Huey Newton defined, power is the ability to define phenomena and have it act in a desired manner. If we can be defined as a certain <clears throat> race or identity or gender or whatever, and then have that definition shaped, we will behave automatically. So that's always the goal. And then lastly, as Kwame Ture used to say, which is why he's, he himself, the formerly you know, known as Stokely Carmichael, why he is himself removed from films like Selma, despite being central, a central figure in that history. He's removed because he himself said, capitalism makes us think we are thinking when we are merely reacting to stimuli. So that's ultimately my shortest answer. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, Professor Fall, I'm David yes, Wilson, sir. President yes, sir. Please. of Morgan Welcome. State. Thank you. Uh, thank, you. <laughs> uh, thank you for a very, very, very um, provocative uh, lecture, uh, as always. Um, actually, Man in Marable uh, was my professor. Um, I took a course from him while I was an undergrad. And I did read his book before he passed away. Uh, but my, my question um, has to do with, if I'm, if I'm following this very provocative theme of yours, that the media has kind of take, it's, it's, the media has looked at King and Malcolm X and has kind of repackaged their philosophies uh, in a way in which to diminish 
what they really stood for and what they advocated for because they want to see the current generation to think about them perhaps in a less serious way. Now, if I got that halfway right, how would you explain perhaps like a Booker T. Washington contemporarily in terms of the way the media would want us to digest that legacy or W.B. Du Bois mm -hmm. or a fan of Lou Hamer? And because these were individuals, especially with regard to Booker D. Washington, that history captured a certain way. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if you were just, just going to look at the words there, whatever accommodation is, right. you know, sort of. Um, if if you were to t just take your same theory and advance it, um, would that kind of way in which Booker T. Washington and people like that presented themselves to us? during that era, mm -hmm. is the same way in which the media would want us to think about them now? Very good question. Uh, and thank you for it. And thank you, of course, for coming. Um, I guess the shortest way I would answer that is that, uh, in, in, in general, I'm very Dr. Uh, Dr. Clarkian on that, John Henry Clark, in my response, in that, in that um, when reflecting back on those giant figures, we need them all. Uh, if we had listened to Booker T for certain things, we would have certain things advanced. If we had listened to Du Bois for certain things, we would be advanced in a certain way. If we listened to Garvey for certain things, we'd be advanced and so on. Fannie Lou, of course, uh, included. What I see happening, and in my, my somewhat associated work on this subject, what I see happening with the representation of all of these people's ideas is that they are packaged in very limited ways for the uh, contemporary moment to have, again, a similar impact. So, so Booker T, we might all have our biases and reach our conclusions, but we have to understand what Booker T was dealing with in his own lifetime and then see how his ideas have been extrapolated and represented back to us today. So for example, in a lot of the black commercial press, which I've argued is hampered by a need to remain in the advertising model, will bring us back a, 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 a reminders of Booker T and Garvey and even Du Bois, but specific to their efforts in entrepreneurial areas. So they'll leave out the rest of their ideas and their arguments. Uh, um, it's easy to do with Booker T in that sense, or easier, I would say, but the same is done with Du Bois, where his, his long life of work is often reduced either to a reference to souls of black folks in, the, in 1903 and the color line, or um, maybe, as is the case with, with this example I'm reaching to here, is his time in the mid-1930s where he's talking about the use of black buying power and the black collective pooling of the resources strength to engage with collective uh, co-ops and economics to, uh, you know, to, to reduce the damage of capitalism on black communities. Uh, but leave out the last 30, 40 years of his life where he became an overt socialist, pan-Africanist, and left the United States to repatriate. So in other words, what I would argue is this, even as I present my own biased view, is that people not take uncritically anyone's depiction of a person or a time in history, look more carefully at the breadth of the work that is av available to those uh, brought to bear on those subjects and reach a certain conclusion with the biases and the structural analysis in mind. So I'm offering a particular bias with my politics. The state and its media apparatuses have their own biases. Uh, and that's what we end up getting packaged to us. And I encourage everybody to, to just think critically about that and as they re reach their own conclusion. The last point, I just want to make very quickly. I, I hear you. I see Dr. John. But just so people, because this is something I don't think was made clear in this re reduced presentation. The work of Manning Marable on Malcolm X is presented to us as an important work, and Dr. Marable was a giant of a figure. And in fact, one of my contradictions is that as a huge critic of that work he did on Malcolm, I see it as standing against the wonderful work he had produced before that. I see it as a departure, in fact. And there's, I think we could speculate and maybe discuss why that is. 
But what I'm arguing here is that Manning Marable's book as a preferred version of Malcolm to be presented and something supported by the institutions of society is brought back to us via the Netflix documentary as a key source in Muhammad's work within that documentary, which then reappears in the most recent ABC Disney product in a reflection of the exonerated accused killers of Malcolm. Uh, uh, and my point being that the ideas that are germinated in Marable's work are redistributed and recycled in such a way uh, as we argued about his work, damages all the memories and, and references to all of those brilliant and radical ideas. So, that, so there is, a, again, a sort of cyclical and recycling that I'm arguing is happening here that is ultimately meant to work against black youth uh, of today. So I hope I did your question justice, Dr. Wilson. And uh, anyway, keep going. Yes, in the back. Uh, hello, my hello. name is Alexander. Uh, some of that. I took a class once. Oh, right on. Good but um, I just wanted to first like make a comment, I guess, that it seems like the way they co-opt Malcolm and MLK is a lot different from the way they would use W.E.B. Du Bois or Booker T. now. And I feel like it's because of the proximity that we have to that time period. Um, I think one of my first realizations when I came to the HBCU and started um, reading up on a lot of these people is that like, oh wow, it's like 40 years away. It's, it's very close. And the way that they co-opt them like frantically in these Netflix documentaries or just like in popular uh, political discourse, it seems like a, like a short-term measure for them to, like as the state like fully... Um, uh, formulates like their reactionary policies, like before they can fully incorporate like a countermeasure through legislation or through laws or reform. Um, media serves like the function of um, sort of like mitigating the damage that these like IP failures um, cost them. Does that make sense? I think so. Um, if I understand you, that I think that is part of the point I'm trying to make, that media are always meant to, well, mediate and manage the, the, the interpretation and the public opinion of, of its target. Um, and to, in this case, correct the failed IP of the original Malcolm and Martin, who in their lifetime were seen as being too radical for support. And people should often, you know, people have to be reminded that Dr. King at the end of his life was not supported, even by those who would claim him today. He was not welcomed by the civil rights leadership anymore. He had a lot of problems with that, with that leadership. There's a great new book called Prophet of Discontent that tracks a lot of this and reminds of a, 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 a alerts us to a lot of new uh, research on this subject over the last decade, unearthing the real radical king. Um, and even in my own humble work, I've shown how the, 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 the elite media targeted Dr. King as an enemy uh, and, and said he was a threat to national security. So they were trying to, so today they come back because these two men are too big to fail, so to speak. They're too big a figure to be completely erased. So they have to be, brought back to us in a different form from what they existed in life. Because in life, they were not welcomed. They weren't welcomed by the state. They weren't welcomed by institutional media. They weren't welcomed by the civil rights establishment, obviously by conservative politics. So how do you bring them back in a way that they won't inspire young people to become the, the failed IP? So uh, now, in terms of the proximity, yeah, they're, they're, they're in some ways bigger figures. They're more contemporary than um, Du Bois and Booker T or Garvey. So the work is a little more difficult. But this is why I've, I've argued for a long time when it comes to Du Bois, he, he, the man lived 100 years and wrote more than most of us could read in a lifetime. And yet we only hear him quoted from the color line and something he said 60 years before he died. What about the rest of what he said? 
Booker T is easily represented, particularly to young people, like I once was, once young and radical, and we were told Booker T was a sellout. But if you look at more, what, I mean, the complexity of the world in which he had to operate and maneuver, and what he was, and, and what he saw as a legitimate goal for his community, makes him a little more complicated than that. But if if you have to fit something into you know a couple hundred characters in Twitter, or into a thirty second TikTok video, it's a lot harder to get to the nuance and sophistication that we need to bring to these people and to the movements and the communities that they come out of. And I think that's part of the goal here. Uh, with, the, with these, what are, again, from the perspective of those who own it, these are just media products. I may get emotional. You may get emotional when you see Malcolm or somebody talking about Dr. King. They're looking at it as a product. What can we gain from this product? And the gain doesn't have to be just financial. This is an ideological struggle as well in terms of media. So I hope I answered your question. I hope I did it some justice. And by the way, whether you're watching this virtually or you're here, I'm easily reached. You can always follow up with me. We don't have to end the conversation right now. Um, so feel free to do so if anybody likes. Is there anybody else before we wrap up? Anything? Yes, in the back. Yes, sorry, I didn't see. Good afternoon. Good My afternoon. name is Milan, and I have a question sure. pretty much going along the lines of since WBD, I mean, W.E.V. Du Bois and Booker T. Washington, they were pretty much, they were figures from over 100 years ago. They have their articles and their works published. However, since it was such a long time ago, compared to Malcolm X and Martin Luther King, they didn't have the media of video. Right. So they weren't recorded, and you're not hearing their actual voice. How do you feel that... Martin Luther King and Malcolm X could have been portrayed if they didn't have that media source of video, if how they could be more radicalized or have their words be changed, kind of, if they didn't have that source. That's basically what I'm saying. No, it's a good question. And I think the, the media technology piece is an important one. Um, it would be, in some ways, easier to distort them. Again, Du Bois... I mean, I, I, I don't think, it, I, 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 I want to say it again for emphasis. I mean, we have to think about that. The man wrote more than we will read in a lifetime. Most of us will never read even everything he wrote, much less as much as he wrote. And yet he's reduced to one or two phrases, largely because he's not easily looked up on YouTube or put on a track. We didn't grow up in the 80s listening to Du Bois on hip hop tracks like we did Malcolm. We didn't hear you know, our parents and grandparents playing records of Du Bois like they could of Dr. King even. So it's, it's harder, but that's also why I think we get so much media of Malcolm and King brought back to us from those who would prefer we not actually understand who they were in the first place. I mean, I've said this myself. I've, I've published some work on Malcolm X. I want everybody to read it. But at the end of the day, all you have to do is go to YouTube and watch Malcolm X videos, and almost nothing you see of him reflected, even in Spike Lee's movie, will be meaningful. It's so easy with Malcolm to see what he really was and why so much effort is brought to distorting him today. Dr. King, a little less so, because you've got to get to the later recordings, and he has that sort of preacher delivery that softens the radical analysis. But go look at the Riverside Church speech he gave a year to the day before his assassination in, 19, uh, in 1967 at Riverside Church in New York. Listen to that speech, and then turn on any of these TV things about King, and, and, see where you, and you'll see the difference immediately. It's like, how did, what are you all talking about? The man is right there saying it. But when it comes to Du Bois, it's a lot more difficult because you actually have to go back and read all of these thousands of pages and then you realize, good God almighty. Every time somebody stands up, to this day, every time I hear somebody stand up and say, the problem is the color line, I get irritated. I get irritated, I straight up, I get irritated, no disrespect, but I'm like, this man, that, he said that in 1903. Then he wrote The World in Africa, Black Reconstruction, on, I mean, he just kept on and on and on and on and on, and people don't refer, they talk about the talented 10th, but they don't talk about when he came back and said that wasn't it, because you all sold out. We need a smaller group. 
a guiding 100. That's going to be the real leadership that take resources that they can achieve in this society and give it back to the people. Anyway, don't give me, I'll keep you here all day. My bad. Can I, can I close with one last question? And this has been an outstanding um, discussion. Your thoughts on the Ida B. Wells Barbie doll. Oh, man. Yeah. So on the one hand, as, as someone who, who raised, is raising two beautiful blackish, brownish daughters, I guess is the way to say it these days, it's hard to find the appropriate symbols. You talking to somebody that blocked gifts when family members try to give life-size white Barbie doll gifts. It's like, nah, it got thrown away immediately. Interrupt, like, anyway, <laughs> the work is hard. So on the one hand, I get it, we wanna see the symbolism, but on the other hand, I'm, I have a, I, I, I'm a little concerned that it's not going to be an encouragement into teaching us who Ida really was, what she represented. This is a heroic woman. This is, this is, a, this is a monster of a, of a, of a superhero. She, she did Rosa Parks a century earlier on a train. She carried a gun for people that tried to lynch her and her crew. She, was, she, was, she should have millions of movies and hours of movies made about her. But I'm uncomfortable with that in the same way I don't want, like I'm, I don't, I'm not for like the Harriet Tubman on the $20 bill and the, Harold Cruz once asked a question uh, that, that I think still has to be answered. He asked, it, so, so, I'm gonna paraphrase, he said, what happens when a colonized or oppressed group's pro or a cultural production becomes part of the cultural store of the state that dominates them? And I think that's a, that's a terrible conundrum. I, I, so anyway, I don't, I, that, it's not an eloquent answer, but, but, but I'm, I'm, I'm disturbed and worried even as I know we need to see appropriate symbols. I just, I just, I don't, I don't, yeah. I don't know is the shortest answer. Do we have time for one more, Dr. Johnson? Absolutely. Okay, please go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, I don't know, that's a tough one. Thank you. I mean, what about the black Barbie doll? I was, in general? I don't my name is Yasmin, tough. I'm sorry. No, um, please go ahead. I wanted to know um, if you, well, with the, with your stance on the Barbie doll and with like the with Harriet Tubman on the twenty dollar bill, what do you think is um, appropriate? You know what I'm saying? So, my short answer is I don't know. I mean, I'm struggling with this like everybody else. I don't think there's one easy answer. What we have tried to do, what I have tried to do, is that in our household, there are pictures of family. There are pictures of Asada Shakur. There are pictures of Malcolm X. There are pictures of, Asada Shakur, by the way, is a Black Panther, Black Liberation Army member who's currently in exile in Cuba <clears throat> with a warranty on her. But she's a hero, and her comrade is Sundiata Okoli, locked up right here in Maryland still, I believe. A uh, member of the Black Panther Party. These are superheroes that should be talked about all the time. Um, so my way of trying to do it, to come back specifically, is to say I try to provide other symbols in the household and in conversation with my children so that they don't have to go outside and, ex and look for a doll to reflect what they need, or they don't have to look outside of the house to get the images that they need, because they're not going to get them. Mm -hmm. So uh, whatever the decision is that parents make is obviously up to them. I just think everything has to be supplemented by more reference to all of these other people and figures and histories. Um, yeah, so as best we can make the house the, what's the word I'm looking for? The, the, the protective yeah, right. cocoon, so to speak. So mm -hmm. that when, we, when they are confronted with other media, with other images and other versions of those images, they you know, uh, have some, some mental self-defense of fitness, as Chuck D once said. Okay. Um, and the last thing I just say is a, pers a personal example. When my children who saw the Black Panther film before me, separate from me, came home and told me, Daddy, we knew you would have been rooting for Killmonger. I knew I had done my job. <laughs> <laughs> Can I ask one anyway, listen, thanks to Dr. Johnson. Uh, uh, thanks to our president, Dr. Wilson, for showing up. 
uh, that was fascinating and wonderful and a surprise and a little intimidating. But no, I'm just playing. And thanks to all, uh, to all the tech crew and everybody for doing the work that they're doing to make this possible, make this visual, or make this uh, visible elsewhere. Thanks to all of you for showing up and uh, for asking questions. And to those who will see this later, hit me up as well if you like. I'm easy to find. And as Fred Hampton used to say to you, we say peace if you're willing to fight for it. So peace, everybody. Thanks again.